morning. Uh, my name is Holly Raby, and I have been living with metastatic breast cancer since 2011. I'd like to introduce our speaker for today. Justin Yap, PhD, is Assistant Professor of Psychiatry at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. He's co-director of the Single Fathers Due to Cancer program. He's a member of the UNC Comprehensive Cancer Support Program, where his clinical practice focuses on providing psychosocial services to both pediatric and adult patients. Dr. Yap has a special interest in working with patients diagnosed with cancer who are parents and have children in the home. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Yap. Thank you very much, and uh, if you guys want to talk to me afterwards, it's, it's Justin. Uh, I'm a psychologist and at the hospital, you know, the real doctors and then there's psychologists, so <laughs> call me Justin. Um, all right, I'm glad you guys are all here today, and uh, ideally this would be something that I would love to have kind of us all kind of sit in a circle and have more of a discussion than a presentation, um, but given the room configuration and the, the filming needs, uh, that's, that's not up for consideration. But um, this is going to be lighter on the presentation and heavier on the question answer. Um, you know, there's only so much that I can tell you guys in broad strokes um, that may be meaningful and that may be more meaningful if we can, uh, if I can answer or give you some, hopefully, some insight on some of your questions. Um, all right. So, like uh, was said, I'm a psychologist at the hospital here at UNC, and uh, we work with all patients of all ages and, and uh, all diagnoses, but uh, I work uh, fairly often with parents of young children or of adolescents who act like young children. Right? Um, uh, it's kind of a, um, a, a little niche of mine, so this is something I've been doing for uh, a little while, and uh, hopefully this will be a worthwhile 45 minutes. All right, so in the spirit of not telling you guys what you know what necessarily what to do or how you should be doing it um, there's I'm only going to kind of map out some real core principles and kind of core components of what what I think again without trying to tell you kind of what you should do but there are a few givens that make this more challenging to kind of present uh, you know in broad strokes and one is that of course every family is different right you guys and your families all have histories before your diagnoses, um, you know, families are, you know, I used to think it was just my family. That was weird. And then I uh, started working in psychology. Like, oh, okay. I guess my family's pretty normal. Um, so every family is different, and that's, and that's a given, and that makes it, uh, again, uh, everyone's unique. Uh, second is you're the expert on your own children and on your family's needs. Um, you know, I imagine you guys have all had plenty of people give you plenty of advice, um, whether it's uh, professionals such as me or maybe your oncologist or friends or family or people you bump into in the grocery store. Um, you know, there's a kind that kind of don't know what to say and kind of, you know, don't know how to act. And there's some that like to tell you kind of how you should do everything. Um, you are the expert. So people, those people, people like me should all be considered consultants at best, but you guys are uh, the ones who know your own kids and your own situation better than anyone else. Finally, there's no such thing as a perfect parent. If you are one, talk to me afterwards. I'd like to use you as a model. Um, a lot of what I see in my, in my practice is that you know, there's, there's, there's a considerable amount of self-doubt and wondering and Am I screwing this up for my kids? Am I not doing things right? Um, you know, should I be talking more? Should I be talking less? Should I be doing this or that? Or I, and I think all those are, are worthwhile thoughts to have. But at the same time, it's not worthwhile to beat yourself up about it and to think that you should be doing this or that, you know, you're screwing up and kind of there's this idealized perfection of how you should be as a parent in general, and then especially a parent going through a challenging time like you guys all are. Um, you guys were not perfect parents before you had cancer. You're not perfect parents now, and you don't need to be. Your kids don't need you to be perfect. Um, and I think that's something worthwhile to remember. All right, so to the core principles, and when we, we get into, again, I want this to be more of a, a question and answer. I think you guys can all write questions on a card if you want, but I'm personally very comfortable if you just wanna shout it out, um, and I think I have to repeat the question. 
uh, for the audio and video, but um, a few core principles that I think a lot of my uh, answers and suggestions may kind of go back to. One, developmental considerations, how old your kids are, right? If your kids are two or four or 16 or eight, what you tell them, how you communicate with them, and what to expect from them is going to differ. Um, and that's uh, certainly not groundbreaking information I just gave you, but it is worthwhile to consider. Um, stability and structure for your family. Uh, that is, you know, always a nice goal, often unattainable. Um, you know, these are, you guys have been through or are going through, uh, you know, very rocky times in terms of trying to keep a schedule and trying to keep your appointments and get the kids to soccer practice and get dinner on the table and, you know, maintaining discipline within the home. So all of that, you know, certainly is at risk for being frayed. But a goal of keeping stability and keeping structure is a good goal to, to strive for, even if it's not always attained. Um, I have a friend of mine who's in the real estate business, and he is fond of saying, as I guess is the saying, that in real estate, it's all about location, location, location. And with your kids, it's really almost all about communication, communication, communication. And it's not just the kind of what to tell them, how to tell them, when to tell them, where to tell them, or how to talk to them, but really it's that you talk to them and that you have open lines of communication. Um, it, you know, it, it's not always helpful to get hung up on the specifics of, of what to say and kind of how to say it, but just that you say it and that you talk and that your kids feel they can come to you and that you feel like you can, you know, give them updates on what's going on or talk to them about things that you or that they may not want to talk about. Um, at the very bottom, honesty. That's a qualified um, statement at the end. Um, I, being honest with kids is important. Being completely honest and being completely open about everything, uh, not always the goal and not always best, uh, depending on your kid's age and kind of where you guys are. Um, I, sometimes we'll talk with families a little bit like when if you go into court, or if you, at least if you watch like Law and Order and stuff, you see people take the stand and they say, you know, I promise to tell the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth. I think two of those three apply, right? Tell the truth, nothing but the truth. The whole truth, that's where you can equivocate. And that depends on what you're comfortable with, where you are uh, in your treatment, and how old your kids are and what you think that, that they can have or what they can handle. So I'm going to not you know, it's early on a Sunday morning. You guys have been sitting in lectures for a day and a half now, so I'm not going to, like, kind of drone on through these. So I'm going to go through them kind of quickly, and then let's get to some questions, okay? Sound good? Yeah. All right. Um, again, I could lecture about those, but that would not be that interesting. They'll come up in our questions. Um, again, uh, life and treatment, there's a disruption of routines, shaken sense of security among you guys, among your family. You know, there's kind of an assumed, idealized future that everyone will be healthy, we'll all grow till we're 85, and everyone, you know, that's, that's shaken. And that obviously affects how the, the tenor of the home environment and uh, kind of how everyone's doing. Again, the stability and structure, um, establish a new normal, because normal may not be possible. Um, discipline and warmth, that's kind of the two, you know, there's been some research in this, and the research that has been done is there's not a whole lot of consistent findings, but one of them that is consistent is if you try and think of two things you can do for your children um, in terms of kind of you know, helping stabilize what they're going through and providing structure in the home, uh, it is providing consistent discipline, just as you would, you know, cancer or not, and being warm with your children. So balancing kind of the you know, how to be, you know, disciplinary with your kids when you know they're going through a lot, so you don't want to give them too much, but you don't want to let them get away with stuff, and you don't try and try and find your balance on that. And the other one is warmth, and that's back to the communication, 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 being open and available, giving them hugs, extra attention, uh, extra, uh, you know, arms around the shoulders is never a bad thing. And protecting some time for family, and that fun is still allowed. Um, that means going over to sleepovers, going to soccer practice, goofing off. Um, again, I imagine most people are pretty good with that. Communications, uh, again, check-ins, updates. Um, you don't have to 
you know, your children don't come with you to your appointments with your oncologist for a reason. Uh, that's because it's up to you guys to kind of be the gatekeepers of what they know and what they understand. But checking in with what, with, with, with how they're doing, with what they're thinking, with what they know, and giving them updates uh, on your treatment status and kind of where you are can be really important. And again, it's because it's back to the, the, just the core principle of communication. I've had plenty of instances where it, 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 the children are thinking something that may not be true at all and that the parents don't really have any idea that their kids are even thinking and would never have any reason to think that they're thinking that. Um, I had one uh, family, just always example sticks out, where the mom was going in for a bone marrow transplant. And that's a heavy ordeal as it is, but their, I think, nine, ten-year-old child was um, extremely anxious about it and couldn't quite figure out why everyone else was not as anxious. Um, and it turns out, just because they finally got talking about it, that the kid thought that his mom was having a bone transplant. And they thought that all the bones were being, like, taken it right. <laughs> so, of course, his mom never would have any idea to, say, to clarify that, hey, this isn't a bone transplant, because it never would have crossed her mind. And, of course, it didn't. But only through that kind of communication did that come out. So the biggest thing about communication, of course, is two ways. One, giving them updates and letting them know kind of what's going on so they don't have to wonder. And then also so you can get a sense of what they're thinking. Um, sometimes the best conversations, I think, happen when you're driving or when you're laying in bed yeah. at night, tucking in. And I think that's partly because there's not eye contact in either one of those. You're kind of looking ahead in the car. You're looking up at the ceiling. You're laying down. Um, I think that's probably what Sigmund Freud had in mind 100 years ago when he laid people on couches and had to look up at the, so they weren't looking at him and they could kind of free associate. Don't worry, I don't go to Sigmund Freud. Um, <laughs> but that's often a surprisingly rich time for these kinds of discussions. Um, and just the last one there, the, the, the game there, is one that sometimes I'll recommend that parents do with younger children, although you can modify it for older ones. And this is, again, just a, a little game or a little tool to kind of get your kids talking and get an idea of what they're thinking. And that's uh, when you lay down with them at night, if you still tuck your kids in in bed, uh, to play the game, the mad, sad, happy, happy, glad game, where you kind of go back and forth and talk about something that made you mad, so that made you sad, happy, or glad during the day. And it doesn't have to be about cancer or treatment or anything. It can be, you know, you guys do it too. You start it out and say, well, I was mad because when I was going to work today, some guy cut me off in traffic, and oh, I don't like that. That made me mad. And your kid may say, well, it made me mad when, you know, Billy jumped in line, the same kind of thing, in lunch line. But at some point, your kid's going to say, well, it makes me sad that you're losing your hair again. And that's the opening, right? Because it, it's hard to feel like you want to, you, you know, you don't want to berate your kids with, you know, how you doing? How, how you feeling? Do you have any questions? You know, sometimes kids mm, close up, especially older ones. But this is kind of a way to kind of just lay out, talk about feelings and thoughts in a very kind of non-threatening way in which you're not even really asking them to talk about your illness. Um, so I've had parents who've had a lot of success with that, just as a, a little tip. Um, second bullet, uh, help children anticipate, give them context for what they're going to be experiencing. Uh, if, just as an example, if you're going through a treatment and you're going to lose your hair, you know, it's often a good idea to let children know beforehand. Again, so I, another example, I had uh, one child who's, uh, the mom relayed the story to me, when her hair fell out again, she had to resume treatment. And her hair fell out, and it really, really upset the kid. And it was only through conversations later. Someone's ready for some football. Sorry. <laughs> I watched some NFL today. Yeah, it's good. No. My son likes football. All right. Um, speaking of kids. Speaking of kids, right, right. Um, so he was really upset when she lost her hair. And it came out later that that was in part because she, he thought that he misunderstood or didn't understand that that was because of the treatment and you know thought that was because of the cancer itself and that it was making her hair fall out and next it was going to make whatever else and it was just that was part of the deterioration but after explanation that that's because of the treatment and the same treatment that's in there beating up those hair cells is hopefully also beating up those cancer cells did the kid kind of understand and kind of get a better context of what he was seeing. So helping kids to anticipate that and understand what they see. Um, actions, explanations, it's best to have those equal kind of your care goals. And if the goal is 
um, you know, if the goal is cure, if the goal is, you know, that we're not, you know, we're doing okay right now, the doctors say I'm doing fine, and that's why I would only go in once a month now, and that should kind of make sense. So whatever the kids see, whatever you tell them and whatever they can see should be consistent with their understanding, your understanding of kind of what your care goals are at that time. All right, oh, there's my little slide about the law and order, uh, taking the oath. Um, you know, you want the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. And again, being truthful, having what you say, be truthful. Um, the whole truth is where we, sometimes we can move that line. Um, just a reminder. Um, all right, so again, I could talk about all these things for a while, but I don't think that would be the best use of your time. Um, so if anyone has any questions, I think that may be a little more, uh, lead to more rich discussion. I see. Well, the one obvious is, is this a question from your kid? No. Uh, okay. <laughs> the one obvious one is, you know, some people may never address this, but, you know, are you going to die? Am I going to die? Right. So how do you, I guess it depends on the age and all those things you just said. Right. So that's why it goes but back to that. In but general, how would you approach that here? What's the question that the kid asks? Are you going to die? Is that simple? So now, yeah. well, from the cancer, I mean, I'm sure right? Oh yeah, right from the cancer. So that's often the question, right? And sometimes, first of all, just as a as a point, I think it's worth clarifying. Now, if a kid asks the question that directly, that's one thing. But sometimes kids will ask questions in a way that are a little more, you know, not quite as clear. At that point, I think it's worth clarifying what the question is. Um, and I'll answer your questions in a second, but. Um, Again, an example. So um, a child was asking his mom who's, and she, she had um, stage four, it wasn't breast cancer, but stage four cancer. And he asked, you know, what's going to happen to me next summer? He was about six or seven. And she kind of stumbled over her answer, assuming that he meant what's going to happen when you're not here. Um, and whatever she said, he, he ended up kind of clarifying the question, no, like, what's going to happen to me? Am I, am I going to soccer camp or basketball camp? Like, it wasn't even about her, but her antenna was so much that everything was kind of, you know, heard through those, through that filter. So it's worth clarifying the question so that you make sure you're answering what your kids are asking you. But if they're that direct, who here has had, que had their children ask questions that directly? That's interesting. You guys have good direct kids. Um, what, and this is, I don't mean to sound like this is a pun, but what did you say? And then you walked away feeling like, okay, I did all right, or like, ooh, ugh. Oh, yeah, it was more of that. Yeah, more than, yeah, all <laughs> right, like, oh, God. I got to go to that guy's seminar, well, see what he says. Actually, I had a video, and it was kind of like a video okay. for children. They could watch it. It was made by children for children. It was actually really quite helpful for them to sit down. And listen to that. So I let them watch that after you talk about it. So that's, that's a common answer, right? Everyone's going to die. And I think and everyone's going to die, and, I, and we don't know what's going to happen. I, again, back to the core principles. You guys are the experts. You guys know your kids. So whatever I say, take it as advice, not as an edict. Um, I think when kids are that direct and they're asking that question, I would imagine that they you know, already know that people are going to die. And what I'm really asking is, are you going to die from this cancer, and when is it going to happen? So I think that and you can often do what psychologists do and say kind of, what makes you ask that question? <laughs> Tell me why you feel that way. Um, but that, that actually is not a bad idea to try and get more. Um, the first question, if they say, mom or dad, or, are you going to die? I say, wow, hon, that's a, that is, that's a big question. What, what makes you ask that? Just to get a little more understanding of kind of where they're coming from. But that can't be the answer, right? That's all, we can't pun it completely. So I th what I often suggest, and again, you guys are the experts, is to say, again, have your actions and explanations consistent with your care goals, which is one of the bullet points, right? So right now, you know, what mommy has or what daddy has is, is very, very serious. And the doctors are giving me all that medicine. That's why I felt so crappy in you know, the last year or whatever. But right now, they are, not, they are telling me that I'm not, they're not telling me I'm going to die right now. And so 
this is a very serious illness and they're not promising me that I can be cured from this at all. But what they are telling me is that I don't have to go to bed tonight worrying that I'm gonna wake up in the morning and not be here. So, it, and if that's consistent with what the doctors are telling you, is right now where I'm at, they're not telling me that's an immediate concern. But, you know, again, the honesty part, right? But I'm not telling you that, promising you that mommy will be fine forever. Yeah, that's the honest part. Mm -hmm. what, what else have people said? Because that, 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 I mean, that, that's a great first question because that's really, I think, what it boils down to uh, in a lot of these. Sure. Mine is just a follow-up on this because I am also someone who is living with um, stage 4 cancer. And it's been Right. And so that's where the communication comes back, because otherwise you don't you, know, you, you can't know what your kid is hearing at school and then what they're starting to process. Exactly. Um, someone else raised it. Yeah. I did, uh, my hand response is that's not my plan mm -hmm. right now. I have that's the best doctors in the world. Yeah, that's why I take this medicine. But my, my question is, um, my kids are uh, eight, six and two. At what point do you add me? But I'm not going. But I'm not going to live forever. You know, I mean, they know that they know that cancer. People die from cancer. People live right. from cancer. You know, but at what point do you have to put that? The last yeah. qualifier on the end. Are they looking for that? Yeah. No, I don't, I don't think so. I think we're okay. I mean, I haven't gotten that far with them. I mean, they know some people die from cancer, some people live with cancer for a long time, mommy's not going to get cured. Right. You know, but doctors are doing everything they can. And right now, that's not my plan. You know? it's, it, but I'll tell you when things change, I guess, we always have those conversations that we can make. Perfect. Of course, I don't know your kids, and, and we've only been talking now for one minute. But I, my sense is that your kids are okay with the current explanation. Yeah. So I would, I would suggest not telling them anything else right now, unless things change, yeah. either with your status or with probably first year, eight year olds' understanding or questions, right? So as he gets, he or she gets older, the questions may come on, and he may, he or she may require a different explanation. But for right now, I, I would wonder if, if that's something that understandably is, is very much in your mind, very much, but may not be a uh, thought that your children um, are having. So I would, uh, to your direct answer to your first question, I would suggest not telling them anything, which sounds like a very unpsychologist thing to say. Um, but again, it, it goes back to the honesty, right? Have you been honest with them? Yes. Have what you said, have what you told them, has it been honest? Yes. Have you told them the whole complete truth? No. There you go. <laughs> so you've told the truth, the truth, but not the whole truth. We don't really that's know. okay. That's the thing. Is people right. really know. So it is. Forget the doctor might have said, well, you have 18 months or maybe they don't say that anymore. But yeah. Yeah. If it's bad, you don't really know. There's all the, it could be for a long time. Right. right. Why scare them today? That's kind of my thought is why, why scare me to like I'm going to die in a week, right? Right, and so that's went back to the first thing, you know, like okay. the, the doctors are telling me, you know, I want you to know that they're telling me that right now, you know, I'm, I'm not going anywhere right now. Okay. And so, cause that, you know, I would not want the, a, a child to feel like every morning they get up and, oh, mom's still here. Yeah. So, you know, if you can, you know, kind of lay out the, sorry, kind of lay it out that, you know, we're, and, and that's a tough balance, right? Because you don't want to promise that you're okay, but 
you're okay for now. Yeah. You're okay for now. And if things change, if my doctors tell me something different, I will let you know. So how do you handle the roller coaster? Because, you know, like all of us, it's not this, you know, we don't just, you know, oh, it's okay for now, and that's done, it's easy, and then, you know, it goes, you know, it doesn't go right. straight down, and it's, you know, down in the, so what happens for me is when things have happened, and, you know, treatment has stopped working, I've had to go on another treatment, when I tell my two teenage boys, 13 and 16, you know, listen, you know, here's where we are right now, because we can try to get contacts to what's mm -hmm. happening, the first thing that happens, unfortunately for them, is they go to denial. They immediately go to, but you're going to be fine, right? You're going to be fine. You told me that, that there were a lot of other treatment options, so I'm holding you to that, Mom. Mm -hmm. So, you know, when we don't even have the information yet, if the next treatment for me is going to work. So that's really hard because, you know, I'm, I'm torn between this desire to not lie, because I don't know. Right. You know, hey, the tumor markers are horrific. It's now in X, Y, or Z place. So how do you um, not scare them to death? Because I, you know, I haven't even I haven't even gone to the next phase of treatment to know if it's going to work. Now, you know, the way it's worked for me is, you know, things have worked, and then they, you know, gone to a very good place again, and then they. But it is going to happen that way. It's a roller coaster. Yeah. So the thing I struggle with is not wanting to burst their bubble, like mm -hmm. you know, oh, you did wrong. This could be it this time. You know, and right. I don't want to say that. Right. But I also don't want them to be falsely positive. I think you can say something like you just told me. I want you guys to know, you, how old, 13 and 16? You guys are 13 and 16. You guys are old enough for me to have these conversations with you. And I want you to know, and we're not going to bring it up at every dinner conversation, but I want you to know now that I am doing pretty good at this moment. But, and do the, you know, but it is a roller coaster, and you've probably seen me go on it. So I want you to know that right now I am doing fine, and we're going to try these medicines, and... You know, I'm not taking this medicine just for giggles. I'm taking this medicine because we hope it works. And it works means that I can be here for a long time. And I would, I mean, I, I, would, I would do the roller coaster with them and say, this is kind of how it goes. Hope is absolutely key. No, 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 no. So, and this is all, uh, not always, but this is often the trick, right? Is to balance hope with whatever your doctors are telling you or with the, uh, you know, with the realistic, at least, you know, long-term view of this. And that's, and that's, it's tricky, <laughs> but it's, it's not impossible. I think that, you know, we, we kind of go in with the mindset that you kind of need to have to have either have one or, or the other, but having both at the same time are very possible, right? So I understand what the doctors are telling me and what they're telling me is I have a very, very tough illness. And this, and this is a difficult situation. At the same time, I'm hopeful that I can be here for a long time, and I'm hopeful that those doctors are wrong. Yeah. Or I'm hopeful that, yeah. you know, I mean, so having both, yeah. right? And, and I, I kind of hesitate to give this next analogy because I, I, it almost sounds a little bit, a, a little bit, uh, not crude, but maybe kind of um, doesn't speak to the gravity of your situation. But, you know, I don't expect to get in a car wreck today but I have insurance just in case. So I hope I'm okay today on the roads, but I know there's a possibility something could happen, so I'm planning for it. Yeah. And I'm ready for it, just in case. I saw a hand, yeah. Um, One more, okay. Uh, we're, we live up in Canada, we've got a, uh, every September there's uh, something called the Terry Fox run. Terry Fox was someone who had leg cancer, and bone. bone cancer in his leg and lost his leg, and he essentially tried to run across Canada. Yeah. Well, in the schools, what they do is they show this video to all the kids, and it shows Terry running this race, and then eventually him dying. And they talk about that, and, and it's a it's a big kind of cancer awareness thing. Well, we really didn't think about it for our four year old at the time, but he came home and he started asking questions. Right? He hasn't put the pieces together yet about death and that, but I know, given every kid in the country does this run or walk or whatever. Mm -hmm. It's going to be kind of that event, I think, that will trigger it. So my question is, not how to deal with that event in particular, but how do you include um, your, the schools that your, your kids are at, the teachers, and, and, and by not giving them too much information, obviously, about your situation, but right. what's the balance? Like, are there, are there, is there a better approach or... I, I think one thing is that there's no way you can accommodate and then you can plan for every 
kid in the class or every teacher and all that. I think you can take steps, like you're talking about, go to your principal or go to your first or second grade teacher for the year and say, hey, just to let you know, um, Billy's mom is going, you know, we're going through a lot. She's being treated for cancer right now. And uh, it's kind of tough. So we just want to let you know so you can be sensitive toward it and that if you see or hear anything that may be helpful to us to know, could you let us know and then keep those lines of communication open with, with that teacher. But there's no way you can kind of safeguard against what every kid's going to say, which goes back to communication, keeping those lines open with your kid. And at some point, if you do the mad, sad, glad game, someone's going to say, well, I'm mad because Johnny said everyone dies from cancer. And there's your opening. Sorry, I ignored you. I don't know if you put up kidney care stalls for young children. It's a doll that comes with hair that comes off, and then it comes back with a short little wig. What's it called? It's kidney, K-I-M-M-E, care. It's kidney, care. It comes with a book. It talks about mommy's going to be sick or grandma. And the doll comes in different colors and hair. Um, and the other thing that I found really useful was a book called um, Someone I Love is Sick, I think, and it's a binder book. So you can, it's for kids six and under, I think, mm-hmm. so that you can add and remove pages. Like if you're going through treatment, people are going to be bringing food over, so they have a like, tutorial thing. Okay. Those are the two resources that I want to share. And the, the best website for this kind of thing is it's run out of uh, Mass General. It's called, it's PACT.org, P A C T. I should put that up there. It's Parenting at a Challenging Time is what the um, what it stands for but pac.org or google parenting at a challenging time and it's um it's a very user-friendly website um yeah and hopefully we're going to have one here some of you might have heard yesterday from lisa park and don rosenstein um we're doing some work here that hopefully we'll have a unc pact.org pretty soon or something something like it and Oh, you guys work it out. Huh? <laughs> you're, you're telling me it's going to get enough. Uh, yeah. Well, I just, you know, my daughter is 11. She was six when I was diagnosed. And at 11, she is just a hormonal ball of tween. And I like that description. Her, hormonal ball of tween. Her breasts are coming through. She's going through puberty. She'll kill me if I say this. But she asked me the other day uh, if she was going to lose her breasts. Hmm. Uh, and I, you know, I have metastatic breast cancer. My mother has bre- metastatic breast cancer. My mother in law has breast cancer. So she sees all these women with no breasts, or she's been with me through my surgeries. And all in all, I think she's handled it pretty well. But, you know, how, when she says, you know, am I going to have breasts or am I going to lose them? I, I was shell shocked. You, you weren't expecting that one. No. How'd you answer? I don't know if I did. You know, I, I probably skirted the subject and I know it's going to come up again. Yeah, and I think the first step would be to validating that question, All right? Well, honey, I, you're obviously paying attention to me and, and grandma, and I, I can see why that would be something you would think about. And I mean, that really, this does sound like punny, but this really is, you know, you're 11, and you know, what's gonna happen 20, 30 years from now, we definitely cannot predict. But what I can tell you for sure is that you don't have to worry about that today. Yeah. And I hope that's something you never have to worry about, but we don't know that. But what I do know is that you have a lot of other things to worry about being a, a young teen. Or, <laughs> yeah, no, right, it's yeah, start, right. So I, I don't think that you can kind of, you know, of course you can't promise anything and, and you shouldn't try, but mm-hmm. to say that that's something you do not have to worry about this year mm-hmm. or next year or the next year. And there'll be time to discuss that if that's ever a possibility, but I would calm her nerves now because you can. Yeah, I said, you know, I yeah. It's like, well, we don't know what's going to happen. Well, that's true, though. You know, that's not, that's not, I, I wouldn't say that's a skirt. That, you know, I hope you never do, but God forbid if it happens, then we'll get through it. You, you got through it with me. I don't think you skirted the issue then. No. <laughs> I, I think you answered it and gave some realistic hope. Mm-hmm. Just have you think how long it's going to be. If any of you guys want to, 
I, I feel, as I often feel like when I meet with people for an hour about this, it's never enough time, right? There's always more questions, and uh, you know, you guys may have some we didn't get to. So if you guys, I'd be happy to give you kind of my card if you want to email me questions later. I'd be happy to do that.